Ancient Greece is under attack from a vast invading army. Just a small force blocks its path. But these are no ordinary soldiers. They are bred for fighting, trained to endure pain, to kill or be killed. These are the Spartan 300. The Spartans were without doubt the elite troops of their age. Advance! They attack in close formation. They moved relentlessly, like a tank, at the enemy. It's a killing machine. It was a bit like being fed face first into a mincer. This is the true story of the Spartan 300's toughest mission. To save Greece from the might of the Persian Empire. Empire, the largest the ancient world has ever known, now has the free city-states of Greece in its sights. Athens, the birthplace of democracy, is about to be overwhelmed by the Persian hordes. Only a small force of warriors stands in their way. The resolve of these men to fight, knowing they were likely to die, is just incredible. Led by their 60-year-old king, it's the toughest mission they've ever faced. They were willing to lay down their lives for the motherland. At dawn, a Persian scout is sent to spy on these men. He finds them oiling their hair and combing it out. To the Persians, it looks ridiculous. They're womanish. Look at the way they're I'm worrying about their hair. What the Persians don't know is that grooming is how these men prepare for battle. They are Spartans. This means they're the most masculine, the most um, virile of all Greek warriors. Spy brings news of these girlish soldiers to his emperor, Xerxes. He can't believe that these effeminate men are a threat. Xerxes demands that they surrender. They've got absolutely no chance. Give up. What's this all about, guys? And um, lay down your arms. But that's the one thing the Spartans never do. Spartan law dictated that a warrior on the battlefield had only two options. That was victory or death. These Spartan warriors come from a rugged, mountainous region. Sparta is the only Greek state with a full-time professional army. They are on a permanent war footing. They were trained for war, the state was geared for war, and that's all the Spartans knew.
Sparta's militarist regime starts at birth. Every baby boy is handed over for a ruthless selection. If they showed any signs of weakness, while well, the Spartans weren't squeamish about taking that child off to a pit outside Sparta, outside the actual living space, and throwing them in a pit where these children, these babies, these infants were bound to die. Those young children who are chosen to survive begin a lifetime of tough training, starting when they are just seven years old. If two boys are fighting and one of them shows a sign of weakness, it wasn't the young boy who got punished for crying out and breaking the code, but it was his older mentor. There's no soft life for a young boy in Sparta. Whatever the weather, they go everywhere barefoot to harden their feet. The system was designed to instill obedience, endurance, resilience, and everything else that the Spartan warrior would need on campaign. These Spartan qualities are very familiar to today's special forces. Ken Jones is a former soldier in Britain's elite SAS. Like the Spartan youths, he has been trained to push through the pain barrier. I draw upon a, a deep sense of pride to keep going and to push myself. I'm, you know, uh, pride at my soldiering ability, and uh, uh, I try and draw strength from all the training I've done and past experiences. I just fill my head with all these maxims like pain is temporary, and you know, it's just weakness leaving the body, and you just try and push yourself on. It's this resilience that they are brought up with to endure pain in all of its forms, whether physical and psychological, that make the Spartans some of the best warriors in the ancient world. Catching their own food is a core part of Spartan training. The boys have to become self-sufficient, relying on their survival skills. This self-reliance means that they're an army that can exist in the field where others would want to withdraw. Today's elite forces are still put through survival training very similar to the Spartans. Soldiers are basically self-sustained for one week where they can only eat what they can catch rabbits, pheasants, or whatever, uh, pick berries or any food they can forage or steal. If you fail this test in the SAS, you could be out. If a Spartan fails, he could starve to death. Basically, they don't feed these boys enough food. Consequently, the boys have to improvise. They've got to be prepared to steal. If you got caught stealing, you were punished, not because you were a thief, but because you were a bad one and you actually got caught. And this promoted the sort of scrounging abilities that were needed by the ancient warriors on campaign. The idea of not getting caught is reinforced in a brutal ritual held every year. The Spartans had a festival, which roughly sort of translates as the Steal the Cheese Festival. Hungry young Spartans have to grab hunks of cheese laid out on rocks. The 
boys are encouraged to try and steal them, to sate their hunger. At the same time though, there are burly chaps with whips and, and cudgels who are waiting to deter these cheese thieves. It teaches them stealth and skills of approach, skills which are going to serve them well when they're facing an enemy. The aim is to condition them for the brutality of battle. If the Spartan boys can learn to ignore pain, then they can stand firm in the battle line, and they can stand firm even when they're wounded and carry on fighting. Resilience. Fighting through pain without fear. Supreme fitness. This is the stuff which marks out special forces through the ages. From the Spartans to the Navy SEALs, it's a direct line. When you come out of training as a SEAL, you're probably in the best shape of your life. You're really like a world-class athlete who is a warrior, first and foremost. The guys are extremely fit. Their mindset, their combat mindset, is unbreakable. After 11 years intensive training, a Spartan recruit is ready to graduate at 18 years old. He is issued with the armor and trappings of a Spartan warrior. His most precious possession is the large, heavy shield. So important to Spartan soldiers, it is drilled into them before every battle. Die rather than lose it. The mother says to the son, come back with this shield or on it. In other words, come back carrying your shield in victory or being carried on it dead. These new recruits are joining the finest military force in Greece. It has a ferocious reputation. They were terrifying. Quite often, armies would see them and melt away. Spartans marched to the fray very deliberately. They moved relentlessly, like a tank, at the enemy. And all this contributes to the notion of um, terrorizing the enemy before the fighting's even started. Joining the army is only the first stage. Every year, the most fearsome warriors are selected to join the elite Spartan Special Forces, the 300. But even within this elite, there is a more select group, the best of the best, known as the Cryptea or Secret Operations Force. These guys are the elite of the elite within the Spartan military system. Just as in the US Navy SEALs, SEAL Team 6 is the elite, tasked with the toughest missions. You know, some people say SEAL Team 6 are the best of the best. When it comes to close quarters battle, there's probably nobody better on the planet. All they do is close quarters battle. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. 
Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. To join this secret force of the Cryptea, the Spartan youths have to carry out their own vicious initiation mission. They are ordered to kill a member of the Spartan servant class, the Helots, who do all the manual labor in Sparta. It's state-sanctioned murder. It basically allows the state to use the Helots almost as a training tool for the more elite members of the Spartan military. For a would-be member of the Cryptea, concealment is crucial. If he gets caught, he fails. Some things have remained constant throughout the ages, and camouflage and concealment is an essential element of Warcraft and, uh, and uh, uh, no, survival in the battlefield. For the Cryptea, this is a rite of passage designed to prove they can kill an enemy in cold blood. They can demonstrate their skills and their prowess, but more importantly, demonstrate their commitment to the state. Are they ready to take lives in the name of Sparta? Today's elite forces are still trained to be ruthless, to switch off any sympathy for the target. You detach any sort of human association with them, the fact that they've got a family and they're, you know, a li living, breathing person. You see it as, as a distinct target and, uh, you know, it becomes easier to objectify it and to kill it. But modern warriors have it easy. With a rifle or pistol, they can kill at arm's length. The young Spartan just has a knife. It would have been very difficult to get one stab and then slip away, so it would need speed, aggression and surprise, the SAS acronym. He'd need to have physical force behind him to try and floor whoever he's assailing. would have been extremely aggressive, violent motion. To kill without flinching. To face death without fear. It's what makes a member of the elite Spartan Cryptea. Many of these men would be among the 300 Spartans preparing to take on the Persian army. The massive force invading Greece is led by the Persian emperor himself. For Xerxes the Great, this is personal. Just 10 years before, his father's troops were humiliated by the Greeks. Now Xerxes wants revenge. There was a combined land and sea invasion of mainland Greece to actually subordinate the entire Greek peninsula, the mainland, and incorporate it as a new province of the Persian Empire. It's a major crisis for the Greek states. They don't have the troops in place to confront the Persians. The Greeks summon a council. They desperately need time to assemble their forces. They turn to the Spartan king, Leonidas, the commander 
of the only professional force in Greece. Eventually, the council comes up with a plan. They decide to use the size of the Persian army against itself by keeping it in the field as long as possible. The massive Persian host would quickly run out of supplies and resources. It would literally strip the region bare of everything it needed to survive, water, food, forage, and so on. And this would place them in quite a predicament. The key to Leonidas' plan is finding a location he can hold, somewhere the Persians can't bring the weight of their numbers to bear. The place he selects is a natural choke point between Mount Calidromon and the sea, known as Thermopylae, or Hot Gates, because of the thermal springs nearby. Here, the only road south narrows to a path just 20 meters wide along the beach. It's an ideal position to defend. It would funnel the Persian troops onto the Greek formation. This greatly favored the Greek fighting style, which was designed for frontal, face-to-face, -face, hand to hand combat. What they didn't want was a position that could be outflanked, where they could be hit from all sides. To carry out this vital mission, King Leonidas chooses to lead personally his elite force the Spartan 300. Supporting his highly trained warriors is a reserve of several thousand Greeks. But it's the 300 Spartans who will hold the front line. And the key to their defense will be the Spartans' most feared fighting formation, known as the Phalanx, a defensive shield wall bristling with spears. This is a unit that can stand an awful lot of punishment being thrown at it, but also is a killing machine. It's a unit that can destroy enemy formations that it's sent against. Listen in. Modern officer cadets test out the Spartan tactics with weapons expert John Naylor. What gives the man the confidence to stand against the enemy in the first place is this thing a large dished wooden shield. It protects two thirds of the target area. So as a warrior, he's got the confidence to fight. Where the Spartans win is with their discipline. Together, they form a mobile wall of shields. The strength of the phalanx lies in meshing together the force of individual warriors. Gentlemen, He's no longer a simple individual warrior. He's part of a fighting machine, a machine where all the cogs work in unison, where the men are not only protecting themselves, but they're protecting the men either side of them as well. If the shields are the defense, it is the spears which do the killing. Spartan's primary weapon is their spear. It's got an extensive reach, so much so that even the second rank can still engage and deliver a killing blow. Under the heat of the August sun, in the narrowest part of the pass at Thermopylae, line after line of Spartans form up. Their phalanx is some 35 men wide and eight or nine deep. As they wait for the Persian attack, they will be feeling the same surge of emotion that today's soldiers feel 
before going into action. Any soldier's gonna feel an extreme rush of adrenaline, a highly charged state, and uh, an injection of pure fear as well. It's gonna be uh, a culmination of many uh, ex absolutely extreme emotions. They'd be willing to die for a cause or, or for their very survival of their race. As the Persians approach, there is just time for King Leonidas to remind his men of their duty as Spartans. This again shows just how fit these Spartans are, that a king of 60 can still be out there leading his troops in the field. The Persians launch their attack. Wave after wave of infantry storm into the narrow pass. Xerxes sent in first, not his absolutely crack infantry troops, but the second division, as it were. I mean, not far below, but below the absolutely tops. It's thousands against 300. The Persians expect an easy victory. But the Spartans stand firm. For the Spartans, it's like a training exercise. These guys are lining up to be killed. Because there's one and a half spears aimed at every single Persian and the Persian might deflect one, and that's where the canny switched on Spartan, just to the side, that spear licks in, and that's another kill. The style of combat that the phalanx engages in is some of the most brutal seen in any age. Most of your opponents are less than two meters from you. You'd be able to hear the screams of those that you attack. You would feel the weapon impacts as they penetrated into an enemy's body. It was a bit like being fed face first into a mincer. Before you know it, the Persians are fighting in pools of blood over the bodies of their fallen comrades. They haven't even got stable footing to attack from. It's a killing zone and it just becomes a mechanical slaughter rather than warfare. By the end of the first day, the Spartans have slaughtered thousands of Persians and sustained only minor losses themselves. Leonidas and his men are confident they can hold on. For the freedom of the Greek states, every day counts. But then, Leonidas hears some troubling news. There is a secret path across the mountains above Thermopylae. If the Persians find this track, they could sneak round the Spartan defensive line and attack them from behind. Leonidas needs his own men at the front, so he dispatches a reserve force of local Greeks. Leonidas sent a contingent of Greeks from the city of Phocis to hold the pass against the eventuality of the Persians coming around behind him. The next morning, the Persian emperor orders fresh troops to prepare to attack. And these are not ordinary soldiers. These are his best men. Xerxes ends up with only one choice. He's got to commit his own elite special forces to try and counter the Spartans. And in this case, it's the Immortals. 
these are seriously good fighters and that they are the, the elite, they are the crack troops of the enemy. They were called the Immortals because they were 10,000 in number and whenever a member of this contingent died, he was immediately replaced so that there was always 10,000 of them. Again, the odds are high, 10,000 against the Spartan 300. But the Immortals' reputation doesn't worry the Spartans. They welcome the new challenge. This was their chance to prove to the Greek world and the Persians exactly what the Spartans were capable of. Funneled into the narrow pass, even the immortals cannot shatter the Spartan defense. The majority of the Persian spears are less than two meters long and they're lighter. When you're faced with the Spartan two and a half meter long spear, you simply can't get by this wall of spear points. This is close quarters combat at its most brutal. The Persians were losing about one man every three to four seconds during the actual combat phases of the engagement. But the battle takes its toll on the Spartans as well. Combat is always horrific. The pressures on the body are immense. Your mouth becomes dry your heart's thumping, the acids build up in your muscles. Most people can only fight for a few minutes at a time before they need to take a breather. Thermopylae in August is like a furnace, reaching temperatures up to 40 degrees centigrade. For the Spartans, it's a long, hot day of fighting, a test even for their stamina. Marshalling his scarce resources in these harsh conditions is the biggest challenge for King Leonidas. You have him as the overall leader of the Greek army, looking at which contingents come forward to fight, at which time, which ones go back to rest. He would also have overall command of logistics and everything else to do with the defence. Water is one of his top priorities. Fighting in full armour in the intense August heat, his men need some 10 litres a day. Leonidas had been clever. He positioned his defensive force just in advance of the main spring line for water. Prepare to advance, advance. The Spartans are so well drilled, they control the battlefield. They can carry out highly disciplined maneuvers, like feigning a retreat there is a large amount of bodies piling up in front of the Spartans. So what the Spartans do is they retreat back a small distance. Prepare to retire, retire. This means that the Persians who are advancing have to climb over the piles of their own dead, disrupting their own formation, and then down onto a small, now level area of battlefield where the Spartans can engage them again in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Spartans, falling back, can instantly reform that shield wall, that wall of metal and 
sinew and muscle and wood, a solid object for the enemy to hit against, and then simply kill a few more. For the immortals, it's a daunting sight as they head towards the front line. This is not the place where you're going to win. This is the place you're going to die. For the whole day, the two elite forces clash, neither prepared to give way. But as the sun sets on Thermopylae, thousands more Persians are dead. After two days of fighting, the Spartans still hold the pass. They just need to keep their discipline and their nerve. But that night, catastrophe strikes. Xerxes is approached by a local Greek who belongs to a people which has not joined the resistance. And as often in Greece, neighbors don't get on well. The Greek traitor reveals the secret path over the mountains. If the Persians can sneak along the coast, they will have the Spartans surrounded by daybreak. In the narrow pass at Thermopylae, Leonidas and his Spartan warriors are exhausted but proud. They have withstood the Persian threat for two long days. But they have no idea of the new danger looming on the mountain above them. That night, the immortals begin their climb up to the ridge above the Spartan position. Night missions are almost unheard of in ancient warfare due to the amount of confusion that the darkness can cause. And this shows just how desperate Xerxes is getting to push these Greeks out of the Thermopylae Pass and how effective their holding strategy is actually working. The Immortals' plan is to outflank the Spartans and launch an attack from behind them at first light. Leonidas thinks he has this route covered, but the Greeks he's placed up on the mountain are not Spartans. They are part-timers. No match for the Immortals. The Persians start to descend down behind the Greek position. Runners from the Greeks holding the path also race ahead to inform Leonidas and the rest of the Greeks that they are about to be encircled. This changes the entire mission. Leonidas received the worst possible news. He was about to be outflanked. His position would be engulfed. But Spartans never give up. Leonidas has sworn to hold back the Persians as long as possible, and that is what he's going to do. On the one hand, he couldn't easily simply flee because flight is not in the Spartans' military vocabulary. So he's got to stay and he's got to make the most of the way in which he stays. Leonidas realizes he cannot win in open battle. It's now, so one version of the story goes, that Leonidas turns to men of the Cryptea, the Spartan secret operations force. The plan is to decapitate the Persian army.
by killing the emperor, Xerxes. Was he simply going out in a blaze of glory? Was he trying to kill Xerxes in an attempt to, as it were, cut the head off the snake in the hope that the rest of the Persian army would wither away and march back to Persia? If you can eliminate the command and control mechanisms, you eliminate the cohesiveness of the army. This will be a mission very familiar to today's special forces. Leonidas is ordering a nighttime assault behind enemy lines with a specific target to take out. To operate at night, you need to be fully alert and focused on all of your senses and your sixth sense as well. So you can be more focused on your surroundings, but also more aware of uh, your own movements and actions. From their base on the beach, the Spartans' most obvious route to the Persian camp is along the shoreline. You've always got the element of surprise, especially attacking at night, and that brings with it a surge of confidence in your ability to get the task done. The first problem the Spartans face is how to infiltrate the outer lines of defense. Reflections in the moonlight could betray them, so they wrap up their polished iron swords. This form of combat is exactly what the Cryptea taught the young Spartans as they came up through their educational system. The Persian guards are not expecting any trouble because night missions are so unusual. To carry out a nighttime raid on an enemy camp or a position, your adrenaline's absolutely surging. The aim is to get to Xerxes' tent, which would be very conspicuous because he brought his caravan, he brought his slaves, his women, his... You know, that's how Persian kings did it. The Spartans now prepare their weapons. They unwrap their dreaded coppice, a vicious hacking sword. Its short, thick blade can cause horrific injuries. First, they have a sentry to take out. It has to be done with a different weapon. Silently, in classic Cryptea style, with a knife. They'd done this sort of thing as 16, 17, 18 year old boys. This idea of specific strikes at a single target. The Spartan night raiders now approach the main Persian camp. They have to find the heavily guarded emperor and kill him. They would be most likely using their swords to hack down any Persian that got in their way as they tried to reach Xerxes. It isn't clear what happened next, but the Persian emperor survives. When dawn breaks, all the remaining Spartans can do is make a final heroic stand. But now the Persians can attack them from both sides. The phalanx is basically useless. It can't take on two directions at once. So the Spartans pull back to a small hill to defend themselves. 
Prepare to retire, re-tire. By this stage, many of the Greek spears are broken. So the Spartans and the other Greeks resort to anything they can get their hands on. Stand at ease. When the phalanx breaks up, when the unit cohesion has gone, that's when you need a weapon to get up close and personal. Fighting with their deadly short swords, even with broken spears, the Spartans won't give up. Finally, having now lost some 20,000 men, the Persian emperor decides to finish off the Spartans at a safe distance. He calls in his archers. Even this doesn't daunt the Spartans. Someone says, you know, the Persians have so many archers that when they release their arrows, it will blot out the sun. To which Deinaches, um, we're actually given the name of the Spartan, says, great, we'll have our battle in the shade. When you can shoot enough arrows to blot out the sun, OK, the Spartans fight in the shade, but those arrows are going to ultimately find their mark. Staring death in the face, the Spartans fight on. Leonidas is fatally wounded. The last of the 300 fall around him. But the Spartan's sacrifice is not in vain. What the defense at Thermopylae did was it bought the Greeks more time, more time to assemble their army, more time to prepare themselves for the eventual invasion of southern Greece by the Persian host. Within a year, Xerxes' imperial force is defeated both on land and at sea. Sparta and its Greek allies remain free. The fearless reputation of the Spartan special forces was forged at Thermopylae. Their epitaph recalls their heroic stand. Go, tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie.